we can go ahead and get started. I'd like to read to you on this windy, wintry evening uh, a little, a little story. Particularly, this copy of it. It's hosted on Babel. I want to read War is a Racket by General Smedley Darlington Butler. Brigadier General Smedley Darlington Butler. Well, that tea, incredibly hot. Burn my tongue, we're off to a good start. War is a Racket by Smedley Darlington Butler, Major General, United States Marines. Retired. Roundtable Press Incorporated, New York, 1935. Copyright 1935, printed in the United States by Select Printing Company, New York. It's a very short little booklet. <laughs> Chapter 1. War is a Racket. War is a racket. It always has been. It's possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, and surely the most vicious. It's the only one international in scope. It's the only one in which profits are reckoned in dollars, and losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to be to the majority of people. Only a small inside group know what's it about. It is conducted for the benefit of very few, at the expense of very many. At a war, a few people make huge fortunes. In the World War, a mere handful garnered profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. That admitted there are huge blood gains in their income tax returns. That many admitted. How many other war millionaires falsified their income tax returns? No one knows. How many of these war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat-infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless, frightened nights ducking shells and shrapnel and machine gun bullets... How many of them parried the bayonet thrusts of an enemy? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle? Out of war, nations acquire additional territory. If they are victorious, they just take it. This newly acquired territory promptly is exploited by the few. The self-same few who wrung dollars out of blood in the war. And the general public shoulders the bill. And what is this bill? This bill renders a horrible accounting. Newly placed gravestones. Mangled bodies. Shattered minds. Broken hearts. Broken homes. Economic instability. Depression and all its attendant miseries. Backbreaking taxation for generations and generations. For a great many years, as a soldier... I had a suspicion that war was a racket. Not until I retired to civil life did I fully realize it. Now that I see the international war clouds again gathering, as they are today, I must face it and speak out. Again, they're choosing sides. France and Russia met and agreed to stand side by side. Italy and Austria hurried to make a similar agreement. Poland and Germany cast sheep eyes at each other, forgetting, for the nonce, the dispute over the Polish corridor. The assassination of King Alexander of Yugoslavia complicated matters. Yugoslavia and Hungary, long bitter enemies, were almost at each other's throats. Italy was ready to jump in, but France was waiting. So was Czechoslovakia. All of them are looking ahead to war. Not the people. Not those who fight and pay and die. Only those who foment wars and remain safely at home to profit. 
There are 40 million men under arms in the world today. And our statesmen and diplomats have the tem temerity, te temerity to say that war is not in the making. Temerity. Hell's bells are these not, are these 40, 40 million men being trained to be dancers? Not in Italy, to be sure. Premier Mussolini knows what they are being trained for. He, at least, is frank enough to speak out. The other day, El Duce, an international coalition, the publication of the Carnegie Endowment for the International Peace, said, and above all, fascism, the more it considers and observes the future and development of humanity quite apart from the political considerations of the moment, believes neither in the possibility nor in the utility of perpetual peace. War alone brings up its highest tension all human energy and puts the stamp of nobility upon the peoples who have the courage to meet it. Undoubtedly, Mussolini means exactly what he says. His well-trained army, his great fleet of planes, and even his navy are ready for war. Anxious for it, apparently. His recent stand at the site of Hungary and the latter's dispute with Yugoslavia showed that. The hurried mobilization of his troops on the Austrian border after the assassination of Dolfus showed it too. There are others in Europe too whose saber-rattling presages war sooner or later. Herr Hitler, with his rearming Germany and its constant demands for more and more arms, is an equal if not greater menace to peace. France only recently increased the term of military service for its youth from a year to 18 months. Yes. All over, nations are camping on their arms. The mad dogs of Europe are on the loose. In the Orient, the maneuvering is more adroit. <laughs> Back in 1904, he has such simple but beautiful language. Back in 1904, when Russia and Japan fought, we kicked out our old friends, the Russians, and back Japan. Then our very generous international bankers were financing Japan. Now the trend is to poison us against the Japanese. What does the open door policy in China mean to us? Our trade with China is about $90 million a year. The Philippine Islands we spent about $600 million in the Philippines in 35 years, and we, our bankers and industrialists and speculators, have private investments there of less than $200 million. Then to save that China trade of about 90 million, or to protect those private investments of less than 200 million in the Philippines, we would all be stirred up to hate Japan and to go to war. A war that might cost us tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of American lives, and many more hundreds of thousands of physically maimed, mentally unbalanced men. Of course, for this loss, there would be a compensating. Profit fortunes would be made. Millions and billions of dollars would be piled up by a few. Munitions makers, bankers, shipbuilders, manufacturers, meat packers, speculators. They would fare well. Yes, they are getting ready for another war. And why shouldn't they? It pays high dividends. But what does it profit the masses? What does it profit the men who are killed? What does it profit the men who are maimed? What does it profit their mothers and sisters, their wives and children? What does it profit their sweethearts? What does it profit anyone except to the very few to whom war means huge profits? Yes. And what does it profit the nation? Take our own case. Until 1898, we didn't own a bit of territory outside the mainland of North America. At that time, our national debt was a little more than $1 billion. Then we became internationally minded. We forgot, or shunted aside, the advice of the father of our country. We forgot Washington's warning about entangling alliances. We went to war. We acquired outside territory. 
At the end of the World War period, as a direct result of our fiddling in international affairs, our national debt had jumped over to $25 billion. Our total favorable trade balance during a 25-year period was about $24 billion. Therefore, on a purely financial bookkeeping basis, we ran a little behind year for year. And that foreign trade might as well have been ours without the wars. Would have been far cheaper, not to say safer, for the average American who pays the bills to stay out of foreign entanglements. For very few, this racket, like bootlegging and other underworld rackets, brings fancy profits. But the cost of operations is always transferred to the people who do not profit. Chapter 2. Who makes the profits? The World War, rather our brief participation in it, has cost the United States some $52 billion. Figure it out. That means $400 every American man, woman, and child. And we haven't paid the debt yet. We are paying it. Our children will pay it. Our children's children probably will still be paying the cost of that war. Normal profits of a business concern in the United States are 6, 8, 10, sometimes even 12%. But wartime profits, ah, that's another matter. 20, 60, 100, 300, even 1800%. The sky's the limit. All that the traffic will bear. Uncle Sam has the money. Let's get it. Of course, it isn't put that crudely in wartime. It's dressed into speeches about patriotism, love of country, and we must all put our shoulders to the wheel. But the profits jump and weep and skyrocket and are safely pocketed. Let's take a few examples. Take our friends, the DuPonts, the powder people. Didn't one of them testify before a Senate committee recently that their powder won the war or saved the world for democracy or something? How did they do in the war? They were a patriotic corporation. Well, the average earnings of the DuPonts for the period of 1910 to 1914 were $6 million a year. It wasn't much, but the DuPonts managed to get along on it. Now let's look at their average yearly profit during the war. Years. 1914 to 1918. $58 million a year profit, we find. Nearly 10 times that of normal times, and the profits of normal times were pretty good. An increase in profits of more than 950%. Take one of our little steel companies that so patriotically shunted aside the making of rails and girders and bridges to manufacture war material. Well, their 1910 to 1914 yearly earnings average? Oh, six million. And then came the war. And then came... <clears throat> the peanut stuck in, stuck in the back of my throat. And then came the war. And like loyal citizens, Bethlehem Steel promptly turned to munitions making. Did their profits jump? Or did they let Uncle Sam in for a bargain? Well, in 1914 to 1918 average, it's $49 million a year. Or let's take United States Steel. Normal earnings during a five-year period prior to the war were $105 million a year. Not bad. Then along came the war and up went the profits. Average yearly profit for the period 1914 to 1918 is $240 million. Not bad. There you have some of the steel and powder earnings. Let's look at something else. A little copper, perhaps. That always does well in war times. Anaconda, for instance. Average yearly earnings during pre-war years 1910 to 1914 of $10 million. During the war years of 1914 to 1918, profits leapt to $34 million. Or Utah Copper, average of $5 million per year in the pre-war period, jumped to an average of $21 million per year. 
Let's group these five with these three smaller companies. Total yearly average profits of the pre-war period of 1910 to 1914 were $137,480,000. Then along came the war. The average profits for this group skyrocketed to 408300000 A little increase in profits of approximately 200%. Does war pay? It paid them. But they aren't the only ones. There are still others. Let's take leather. For the three-year period before the war, the total profits of Central Leather Company were $3.5 million. It's approximately $1,167,000 a year. Well, in 1916, Central Weather returned a profit of $15,500,000. A small increase of 1,100%. That's all. General Chemical Company averaged a profit for the three years before the war of over $800,000 a year. Came to the war and the profits jumped to $12 million a year. A leap of 1,400%. International Nickel Company. You can't have a war without nickel. Showed an increase in profits from a mere average of $4 million a year to $73.5 million dollars a year. Not bad. An increase of more than 1,700%. American Sugar Refining Company averaged $2 million a year in the three years before the war. 1916 had a profit of $6 million. Listen to Senate document number 259, the 56th Congress reporting on corporate earnings and government revenues. Considering the profits of 122 meat packers, 153 cotton manufacturers, 299 garment makers, 49 steel plants, 340 coal producers during the war. Profits under 25% were exceptional. For instance, the coal companies made between 100% and 7,856% on their capital stock during the war. Chicago packers doubled and tripled their earnings. Let us not forget the bankers who financed the Great War. If anyone had a cream of the profits, it was the bankers. Being partnerships rather than incorporated organizations, they do not have to report to stockholderships. And their profits were a secret, as they were immense. How the bankers made their millions and billions, I do not know. Because those little secrets never become public, even before a Senate investigatory body. But here's how some of the other patriotic industrialists and speculators chiseled their way into war profits. Take the shoe people. They like war. Brings business with abnormal profits. They made huge profits on sales abroad to our allies. Perhaps like munitions manufacturers and armament makers, they also sold to the enemy. For a dollar is a dollar, whether it comes from Germany or from France. But they did well by Uncle Sam too. For instance, they sold Uncle Sam 35 million pairs of hobnailed service shoes. There were 4 million soldiers. 8 pairs and more to a soldier. My regiment during the war only had a pair to a shoulder, soldier. Some of these shoes are probably still in existence. They were good shoes. But when the war was over, Uncle Sam had a matter of 25 million pairs left over. Bought and paid for. Profits recorded and pocketed. Still lots of leather left, so the leather people sold your Uncle Sam hundreds of thousands of McClellan saddles for the cavalry. But there wasn't any American cavalry overseas. Somebody had to get rid of the leather, however. Somebody had to make a profit on it. So we had a lot of McClellan saddles. We probably have those yet. Also, somebody had a lot of mosquito netting. Sold your Uncle Sam 20 million mosquito nets for the use of soldiers overseas. Suppose the boys were expected to put it over them as they tried to sweep in the muddy trenches. One hand scratching cooties on their backs and the other making passes at scurrying rats. Well, not one of these mosquito nets ever got to France. Anyhow, the thoughtful manufacturers wanted to make sure that no soldier would be without his mosquito net, so 40 million additional yards of mosquito netting were sold to Uncle Sam. There were pretty good profits, mosquito netting in war days, 
even if there were no mosquitoes in France. I suppose if the war had lasted just a little longer, the enterprising mosquito netting manufacturers would have sold Uncle Sam a couple consignments of mosquitoes to plant in France so that more mosquito netting would be in order. Airplane and engine manufacturers felt they too should get their just profits out of the war. And why not? Everyone else was getting theirs. So one billion dollars, count them in, count them if you live long enough, was spent by Uncle Sam in building airplanes and airplane engines that never left the ground. Not one plane or motor out of the billion dollars worth ordered ever got into a battle in France. Just the same, the manufacturers made their little profit 30 100 or even 300 percent. Undershirts for soldiers cost 14 cents to make. Uncle Sam paid 30 to 40 cents for each of them. Nice little profit for the undershirt manufacturer. And the stocking manufacturers and uniform manufacturers and the cap manufacturers and the steel helmet manufacturers. Well, they all got theirs. Why, when the war was some four million sets of equipment, knapsacks and things that had to fill them, crammed warehouses on this side. Now they're being scrapped because regulations have changed contents. But the manufacturers collected the wartime profits on them, and they'll do it all over again next time. There were lots of brilliant ideas for profit making during the war. One very versatile patriot sold Uncle Sam 12 dozen 18 inch wrenches. Oh, they were very nice wrenches. The only trouble is that there was only one nut ever made that was large enough for these wrenches. That's the one that holds the turbines at Niagara Falls. Well, after Uncle Sam had bought them and the manufacturer pocketed the profit, the wrenches were put on freight cars and shunted all around the United States in an effort to find a use for them. When the armistice was signed, it was indeed a sad blow to the wrench manufacturer. We were just about to get some nuts to fit the wrenches. Then he planned to sell these, too, to your Uncle Sam. Still... Another had the brilliant idea that colonels shouldn't ride in automobiles, nor should they even ride horseback. One had probably seen a picture of Andy Jackson riding on a buckboard. Well, some 6,000 buckboards were sold to Uncle Sam for the use of colonels. Not a one of them was used. But the buckboard manufacturer got the war profit. Shipbuilders, too, felt they should get in on some of it. Built a lot of ships that made a lot of profit. More than $3 billion worth. Some of the ships were alright, but $635 million worth of them were made of wood and wouldn't float. Seams opened up, and they sank. We paid for them, though. And somebody pocketed the profits. It's been estimated by statisticians and economists economists, economists, and researchers that the war cost for your Uncle Sam was some $52 billion. Of this sum, $39 billion was expended in the actual war period. The expenditure yielded $16 billion in profits. That's how the 21,000 billionaires and millionaires got that way. This $16 billion in profit is not to be sneezed at. It's quite a tidy sum. And it went to a very few. The Senate Committee probe of the munitions industry and its wartime profits, despite its sensational disclosures, hardly scratched the surface. Even so, it's had some effect. The State Department has been studying, for some time, methods of keeping out of war. War Department suddenly decides it has a wonderful plan to spring. The administration names a committee with the War and Navy Departments ably represented to the chairmanship of a Wall Street speculator to limit profits in wartime. To what extent isn't suggested. Hmm. Possibly the profits of 300, 600, 1600 percent of those who turned blood into gold in the World War would be limited to some smaller figure. Apparently, however, the plan does not call for any limitation of losses. That is, the losses of those who actually fight the war. As far as I've been able to ascertain, there's nothing in the scheme to limit a soldier to the loss of but one eye, or one arm, or to limit his wounds to one, or two, or three. Or to limit the loss of life. There is nothing in the scheme, apparently, that says not more than 12% of a regiment shall be wounded in battle. 
and that not more than 7% of a division shall be killed. Of course, the committee cannot be bothered with such trifling matters. Chapter 3. Who pays the bills? Who provides the profits? These nice little profits of 20, 100, 300, 1500, 1800 percent. Well, we all pay them. In taxation. We paid the bankers their profits when we bought Liberty Bonds at $100 and sold them back at $84 or $86 to the bankers. These bankers collected $100 plus. Simple manipulation. The bankers control security marts. It was easy for them to depress the price of these bonds. Then all of us, the people, got frightened. Sold the bonds at $84 or $86. The bankers bought them. Then these same bankers stimulated a boom. Government bonds went to par and above. And then the bankers collected their profits. But the soldier pays the largest part of the bill. If you don't believe this, visit the American cemeteries on the battlefields abroad. Visit any of the veterans' hospitals in the United States. On a tour of the country in the midst of which I am at the time of this writing, I visited 18 government hospitals for veterans. In them are a total of about 50,000 destroyed men, men who were the pick of the nation 18 years ago. The very able chief surgeon at the government hospital in Milwaukee, where there are 3,800 of the living dead, told me that mortality amongst veterans is three times as great as among those who stayed at home. Boys with a normal viewpoint were taken out of the fields and offices and factories and classrooms and put into the ranks. There they were remolded. They were made over and made to about face to regard murder as the order of the day. They were put shoulder to soldier, shoulder, and through mass psychology, they were entirely changed. We used them for a couple of years, trained them to think nothing at all for killing or being killed, and then suddenly we discharged them, told them to make another about face. This time, they had to do it their own readjusting. Sans mass psychology, sans officers' aid and advice, sans nationwide propaganda, we didn't need them anymore. So we scattered them about without any three-minute or liberty loan speeches or parades. Many, too many, of these fine young boys are eventually destroyed mentally because they could not make that final about face alone. In the government hospital in Marion, Indiana, 1,800 of these boys are in pens. 500 of them in a barracks with steel bars and wires all around the outside building and on the porches. These already have been mentally destroyed. These boys don't even look like human beings. Now the look on their faces. Physically, they're in good shape. Mentally, they're gone. There are thousands and thousands of these cases. More and more coming in all the time. The tremendous excitement of the war, the sudden cutting off of that excitement, these young boys couldn't stand it. That's a part of the bill. So much for the dead. They paid their part of the war profits. So much for the mentally and physically wounded. They're paying now their share of the war profits. But the others paid too. They paid with the heartbreak. They tore themselves away from firesides and families to don the uniform of Uncle Sam on which a profit had been made. Paid another part in the training camps where they were regimented and drilled while others took their jobs and places in their lives of their communities. They paid for it in the trenches when they shot and were shot, when they went hungry for days at a time, where they slept in the mud and in the cold and in the rain with the moans and shrieks of the dying for a horrible lullaby. And don't forget... The soldier paid part of the dollars and cents bill, too. Up to, and including the Spanish-American War, we had a prize system. Soldiers and sailors fought for money. During the Civil War, they were paid bonuses, in many instances before they went into service. The government or states paid as high as $1,200 per enlistment. In the Spanish-American War, they get prize money. When we captured any vessels, the soldiers all got their share. At least they were supposed to. Then it was found that we could reduce the cost of wars by taking all the prize money and keeping it, but conscripting the soldier anyway. 
then the soldiers couldn't bargain for their labor. Everyone else could bargain, but the soldier couldn't. Napoleon once said, All men are enamored of decorations. They positively hunger for them. So, by developing a Napoleonic system, the metal business, the government learned it could get soldiers for less money, because the boys liked to be decorated. Until the Civil War, there were no medals. Then the Congressional Medal of Honor was handed out, making enlistments easier. After the Civil War, no new medals were issued until the Spanish-American War. In the World War, we used propaganda to make the boys accept conscription. They were made to feel ashamed if they didn't join the army. So vicious was this war propaganda that even God was brought into it. With few exceptions, our clergymen joined in the clamor to kill, 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 to kill the Germans. God is on our side. It's his will that Germans be killed. And, in Germany, good pastors called upon the Germans to kill the Allies, to please the same God. That was a part of the general propaganda, built up to make people war-conscious and murder-conscious. Beautiful ideals were painted for our boys who were sent out to die. This was the war to end wars. This was the war to make the world safe for democracy. No one told them that dollars and cents were the real reason. No one mentioned to them as they marched away that their going and their dying would mean huge war profits. No one told these American soldiers they might be shot down by bullets made by their own brothers here. No one told them that the ships on which they were going to cross might be torpedoed by submarines built with United States patents. They were just told it was going to be a glorious adventure. Thus, having stuffed patriotism down their throats, it was decided to make them help pay for the war too. So we gave them a large salary of $30 a month. All they had to do for this magnificent sum was to leave their dear ones behind, give up their jobs, lie in swampy trenches, eat canned willy when they could get it, and kill, and kill, and kill, and be killed. But wait! Half of that wage, just a little more in a month than a riveteer in a shipyard or a laborer in a munitions factory safe at home makes in a day, was promptly taken from him in order to support his dependents, so that they would not become a charge on his community. Then we made him pay what amounted to accident insurance, something that the employer pays for in an enlightened state cost him $6 a month. He had less than $9 a month left. Then, the most crowning insolence of all, he was virtually blackjacked into paying for his own ammunition, clothing, and food by being made to buy liberty bonds. Most soldiers got no money at all on paydays. Made them buy liberty bonds at $100 each. Then we paid them back. When they came back from the war and couldn't find work, at $84 and $86. Soldiers bought about $2 billion worth of these bonds. Yes, the soldier pays the greater part of the bill. His family pays it too. They pay it in the same heartbreak that he does. As he suffers, they suffer. At nights, as he lay in the trenches and watched shrapnel burst about him, they lay home in their beds and tossed sleeplessly. His father, his mother, his wife, his sisters, his brothers, his sons, his daughters. When he returned home minus an eye or minus a leg or with his mind broken, they suffered too. As much as, and sometimes even more so, than he. Yes, and they too contributed their dollars to the profits and the munitions makers and the bankers and the shipbuilders and manufacturers and the speculators. They too bought liberty bonds and contributed to the profit of the bankers after the armistice and the hocus pocus of manipulated liberty bond prices. And even now the families of the wounded men and the mentally broken and those who were never, were never able to readjust themselves are still suffering and still paying. Chapter 4. How to Smash This Racket Well, it's a racket, all right. A few profit, and the many pay. But there is a way to stop it. You can't end it by disarmament conferences. You can't eliminate it by peace parlays at Geneva. Well-meaning but impractical groups can't wipe it out by resolution. It can be smashed effectively, 
only by taking the profit out of war. The only way to smash this racket is to conscript capital and industry and labor before the nation's manhood can be conscripted. One month before the government can conscript the young men of the nation, it must conscript capital and industry and labor. Let the officers and directors and high-powered executives of our armament factories and steel companies and munitions makers and shipbuilders and airplane builders and manufacturers of all the other things that provide profit in wartime, as well as the bankers and the speculators, be conscripted to get $30 a month. The same wage as the lads in the trenches get. Let the workers in these plants get all the same wages. All the workers, all presidents, all executives, all directors, all managers, all bankers, and yes, all generals and admirals and officers and politicians, all government office holders, everyone in the nation be restricted to a total monthly income not to exceed that paid to a soldier in the trenches. Let all the kings and tycoons and masters of business and all those workers and industries and all our senators and governors and mayors pay half of their monthly $30 in wage to their families and pay war risk insurance and buy liberty bonds. And why shouldn't they? They aren't running any risk of being killed or having their bodies mangled or their minds shattered. They aren't sweeping in muddy trenches. They aren't hungry. The soldiers are. Give capital and industry and labor 30 days to think it over, and you'll find by that time there will be no war. That'll smash a war racket. That, nothing else. Maybe I'm a little too optimistic. Capital still has some say, so capital won't permit the taking a profit out of war until the people. Those who do the suffering and still pay the price make up their minds that they elect to office shall do their bidding not that of profiteers. Another step necessary in this fight to smash a war racket is a limited plebiscite to determine whether war should be declared. A plebiscite not of all voters, but merely those who would be called upon to do the fighting and the dying. There wouldn't be very much sense in having the 76-year-old president of a munitions factory or the flat-footed head of an international banking firm or the cross-eyed manager of a uniform manufacturing plant, all of whom see visions of tremendous profits in the event of war, voting on whether the nation should go to war or not. They never would be called to shoulder arms, only sleep or to sleep in a trench or to be shot. Only those who would be called upon to risk their lives for their country should have the privilege of voting to determine whether the nation should go to war. There is an ample precedent for restricting the voting to those affected. Many of our states have restrictions on those permitted to vote. In most, it's necessary to be able to read and write before you vote. In some, you must own property. Be a simple matter each year for the men coming of military age to register in their communities as they did in the draft during the World War and be examined physically. Those who could pass and those would therefore be called upon to bear arms in the event of a war would be eligible to vote in a limited plebiscite. They should be the ones to have the power to decide. Not a congress of the few whose members are within the age limit and fewer still are within the physical condition to bear arms. Only those who must suffer should have the right to vote third step in the business of smashing the war racket is to make certain that our military forces are truly forces for defense only. At each session of Congress, the question of further naval appropriations comes up. Swivel chair admirals of Washington, and there are always a lot of them, are very ardoit. Ardoit? I don't know this word. Adroit? Ardent? Is what I'm understanding it to mean lobbyists, and they're smart. They don't shout, we need a lot of battleships to war in this nation or that nation. No, no. First of all, they let it be known that America is menaced by a great naval power. Almost any day, these admirals will tell you a great fleet of this supposed enemy will suddenly strike and annihilate 125 million of our people. Just like that. Then they begin to cry for a larger navy. For what? To fight the enemy? Oh my, oh no. For defensive purposes only. Then, incidentally, they announced maneuvers in the Pacific. For defense. Uh-huh. The Pacific is a big ocean. We have a tremendous coastline on the Pacific. Will the maneuvers be off the coast? Two or three hundred miles? Oh, no, the maneuvers will be 2,000. Yes, perhaps even 3,500 miles off the coast. Japanese, a proud people, of course, will be pleased beyond expression to see the United States fleet so close to Nippon's shores. 
even as pleased as would be the residents of California, were they to dimly discern through the morning mist a Japanese fleet paying, playing at war games off of Los Angeles. Ships of our Navy, it can be seen, should be specifically limited by law to be within 200 miles of our coastline. Now, had that been the law in 1898, the Maine never would have gone to Havana Harbor. She never would have been blown up. There would have been no war with Spain and its attendant loss of life. 200 miles is ample in the opinion of experts for defense purposes. Our nation cannot start an offensive war if its ships can't go further than 200 miles from the coastline. Planes might be permitted to go as far as 500 miles from the coast for purposes of reconnaissance. And the army should never leave the territorial limits of our nation. To summarize. Three steps must be taken to smash the war racket. We must take the profit out of war. We must permit the youth of the land who would bear arms to decide whether or not there should be war. And we must limit our military forces to home defense purposes. Chapter 5. To hell with war. I am not such a fool as to believe that the war is a thing of the past. I know people do not want war, but there is no use in saying we cannot be pushed into another war. Looking back, Woodrow Wilson was elected president in 1916 on a platform that he had kept us out of war. An implied promise he would keep us out of the war. Yet, five months later, he asked Congress to declare war on Germany. In that five-month interval, the people had not been asked whether they had changed their minds. Four million young men who put on uniforms and marched or sailed away were not asked whether they wanted to go forth to suffer and to die. Then what caused our government to change its mind so suddenly? Money. An Allied commission, it may be recalled, came over shortly before the war declaration and called on the president. The president summoned a group of advisors. The head of the commission spoke. Stripped of its diplomatic language, this is what he told the president and his group. There is no kidding ourselves any longer. The cause of the Allies is lost. We now owe you, American bankers, munitions makers, manufacturers, speculators, exporters, five or six billion dollars. If we lose, and without the help of the United States, we must lose. We, England, France, and Italy cannot pay back this money. And Germany won't. So... Had secrecy been outlawed as far as war negotiations were concerned, and had the press been invited to be present at that conference, or had radio been available to broadcast the proceedings, America never would have entered the World War. But this conference, like all war discussions, was shrouded in the utmost secrecy. When our boys were sent off to war, they were told it was a war to make the world safe for democracy, and a war to end all wars. Well, 18 years after, the world has less of democracy than it had then. Besides, what business is it of ours whether Russia or Germany or England or France or Italy or Austria live under democracies or monarchies, whether they're fascists or communists? Our problem is to preserve our own democracy. And very little, if anything, has been accomplished to assure us that the World War was really the war to end all wars. Yes, we've had disarmament conferences and limitations of arms conferences. They don't mean a thing. One has just failed. The results of another have been nullified. We send our professional soldiers and our sailors and politicians and diplomats to these conferences. And what happens? The professional soldiers and sailors don't want to disarm. No admiral wants to be without a ship. No general wants to be without a command. Both mean men without jobs. They are not for disarmament. They cannot be for limitation of arms. And all of these conferences lurking in the background, but all powerful, just the same, are the sinister agents of those who profit by war. They see to it that these conferences do not disarm or seriously limit armaments. The chief aim of any power at any of these conferences has not been to achieve disarmament in order to prevent war, but rather to endeavor to get more armament for itself and less for any potential foe. There's only one way to disarm without any semblance of practic practicability. That is, for all nations to get together every to get together and scrap every ship, every gun, every rifle, every tank, every warplane. Even this, if it were at all possible, would not be enough. 
The next war, according to experts, will not be fought with battleships, nor by artillery, not with rifles and machine guns. It will be fought with deadly chemicals and gases. Secretly, each nation is studying and perfecting newer and ghastlier means of annihilating its foes wholesale. Yes, ships will continue to be built, shipbuilders must make their profits, and guns still will be manufactured, and powder and rifles will be made, for the munitions makers must make their huge profits. And the soldiers, of course, must wear uniforms. And manufacturers must make their war profits too, but victory or defeat will be determined by skill and ingenuity of scientists. If we put them to work making poison gas and more and more fiendish mechanical and explosive implements of destruction, they will have no time for the constructive job of building a greater prosperity for all peoples. By putting them to this useful job, we can make more money out of peace than we can out of war even with the munition makers. So I say, to hell with war. That's it. War is a racket. Smedley Butler. Just fantastic. Just fantastic. And the, the idea about having a popular national vote, or a popular vote from the conscripted individuals if you should have a war or not that is genius that's truly genius the idea of <laughs> you know if we're at war okay everybody in the country makes as much as a soldier oh smedley you are more of a communist than you know smedley uh butler did not as I recall, identify as a socialist or a communist. Uh, as I understand it, he, uh, <laughs> he was a progressive and barely that. I mean, he, Smagley Butler, had an amazing, amazing career. I mean, his military career started in 1898. He was in the Philippine-American War, the Boxer Rebellion, Banana Wars in Honduras, I, Central America, Philippines again, Veracruz, Mexico, Haiti. He fought in the First World War. He, like, gee, he fought all over the fucking place. So this war is a racket booklet that he wrote and it really just is a booklet it's quite short right he wasn't writing as an armchair general he wasn't writing as some theorist he was writing as someone who, who lived this and saw it firsthand now he was also a person who made the alleged 1934 business plot known a political conspiracy by business leaders to overthrow president roosevelt Now, no one was officially ever charged for it, and a lot of investigations say that it was inconclusive, but I'm fairly certain that he stopped a fascist coup. He was invited to participate in it, in fact. <sighs> yeah, died in 1940. Just an incredible, incredible human being. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's War is a Racket. Took about an hour. I'd say take a look at it yourself, but I mean, you've seen it. You've seen the, the OG thing. It's, it's very short. That's why I wanted to read it tonight. <sighs> yeah. When, uh, when talking about theory, um, you know, Marxist theory, socialist theory, anarchist theory, we often think about, you know, Marx, Lenin, Luxembourg. But there are thinkers like Butler who were populists, who had very very interesting democratic ideas about how to restructure society in a way that valued human life. 
that has really won the hearts <laughs> of of socialists and communists and anarchists since at least in the United States. I mean yeah, just just a hell of a man. Anyway, I've rambled on for long enough. I'll go ahead and put in a cut here. I I would not be opposed to still streaming, but it's getting late. I should probably sleep. I'm not at all tired. If you're watching on YouTube, um, until later, I'm going to say toodaloo. Take care. I'll see you then. Uh, bye bye